Hey guys, it's Tim Miller with The Bulwark. I had a conversation with Congressman Jake Auchincloss of Massachusetts about how he's the one congressman with the balls to actually say, no, we are not going to help bail the Republicans out of their mess. And if the Republicans want Democratic help to pass budgets, then they need to meet some Democratic priorities, particularly funding Ukraine and supporting our allies in Ukraine. So this is a great conversation. We get into Mitch McConnell, Kevin McCarthy and their failings, Ukraine and immigration and the border. Please enjoy. All right, I'm here with Congressman Jake Auchincloss, Democrat of Massachusetts. Um, Congressman, thanks so much for doing this. Thanks for having me on, Tim. Um, I, as I mentioned, I was um, I was really intrigued and excited to do this. I, I don't often get excited by statements uh, that are put out by uh, by congressmen. A lot of boring statements get put on by, out by congressmen. I don't know if you notice that, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when you voted against the continuing resolution, uh, which was, you know, Speaker Johnson's effort just kind of kicked the can on keeping the government open uh, for a few more months um, recently, uh, you basically said you're tired of bailing out Republicans um, if they're not willing to deal with Ukraine. Uh, talk to us about like why you decided to do that, and, and then we can get into the, the strategy a little bit of dealing with this Republican conference. The party of Ronald Reagan who helped break up the Soviet Union is now trying to help Vladimir Putin recreate it. It's shameful. And we need to strengthen the hand of those Reagan Republicans who still exist in both the House Republican and Senate Republican conferences in ensuring that we unlock continued Ukrainian aid because the Ukrainians are fighting on the front lines of the free world. And it has been the highest and best national security return on investment in my entire lifetime. For less money than Americans spend on soft drinks every year, we have cratered Russia's conventional military capacity. We have doubled its border with NATO. We have uh, induced more defense spending from our allies, not just in Europe, but also in East Asia. And we have sent a strong message, not just to the Kremlin, but also to Beijing, that the United States is going to stand with freedom and democracy the world over. Now, under pressure from Donald Trump and his MAGA fanatics, even Mitch McConnell is talking about throwing in the towel on Ukraine. We cannot allow that to happen. Yeah, I want to get to that. So it's just earlier today, we're taping this Thursday afternoon. Um, uh, a, a leak from a private Senate Republicans meeting uh, to Punchbowl uh, indicated that McConnell told GOP senators uh, about this deal uh, that is being discussed between with between that would combine border security and Ukraine aid and, and some other things, including support for Israel and Taiwan. He said the politics of this have changed, referring to Trump having won the first Iowa caucus, the New Hampshire primary, and said that we're in a quandary and essentially essentially saying that Trump uh, does not want a deal because uh, he wants to be able to campaign on on border chaos, and that means that you know at this point they should just kind of let this wither. I, a pretty shocking and appalling uh, like level of cynicism from like the king of cynicism. I, you know when Mitch McConnell surprised you with his cynicism, that's a bad sign. Well, like what is your sense? What are you hearing from colleagues about the state of play on that as it stands right now? It's devastating to hear because Mitch McConnell until that statement had really been one of the last remaining bulwarks uh, in Congress on the Republican side of the aisle for making not just the strategic case, but the moral case for defending Ukraine. And to hear him say that Donald Trump's election, and we all know that Mitch McConnell is no fan of Donald Trump, to hear him say that Donald Trump's election now is prioritized over uh, defending the rules-based international order that has spread peace and prosperity the world over since World War II, that has been the foundation of American hegemony, uh, that, it, that Donald Trump's election is now prioritized over border security, which I strongly support and which Democrats do want to compromise on in order to get to a solution that works even in an election year. It just, it indicates how fundamentally broken the GOP now is. Uh, and Unless people like Mitch McConnell, uh, John Thune, uh, and Speaker Johnson, unless that crew is willing to demonstrate political courage, uh, nothing is going to get done in 2024 in Congress. 
The fact that you struggle to come up with names of Republicans that are willing to get things done it is pretty telling, uh, I think. Um, as like reaching for who else? Thune, maybe Barassa? I, who can I come up with? Is someone else? Can I come up with a name? Corner? Um, okay, I want to I want to get into the strategy at the end here, but just on the merits of both these issues, just briefly. I mean, the the abdication of Ukraine is already uh, having consequences, right? Like the fact that, that we did not re up this funding last year, and there's been reports from Ukraine about like, running out of ammunition and bullets. And, and you know, I, it would seem that even for Republicans that have objections to certain cash support for Ukraine funding, that like the military equipment and services uh, it should be a no-brainer. And, and, and the, the aid to Russia and the consequences for our ally are already palpable. I and mean, what's your sense for kind of that you know, like what's practically happening right now in Ukraine because of what the Republicans are doing here. Absolutely. So it, there's no doubt that Republican intransigence and Donald Trump's de facto securing the nomination is bad for Ukrainian morale and a boost for Vladimir Putin. And indeed, Vladimir Putin was bragging about that on his uh, end of year uh, propaganda. I, however, do not share in the prevailing pessimism about Ukraine's chances. I think if, if you conceive of Ukrainian victory in this war as sustained and secure access to the Black Sea, uh, of sovereignty and self-determination in its ability to, to join the West, which is really its core aspiration, uh, and of uh, the inability of Russia through both security guarantees and Ukraine's own strength to credibly threaten them again uh, in the near term, I believe that those aims are achievable by Ukraine. I, I do not share in the pessimism that somehow this is destined to become a, a frozen conflict uh, in perpetuity, or even that Russia is, is going to have a, a stronger 2024. Ukraine can win, um, but it's going to need materiel. And the materiel that we have been sending uh, has been working, and we should send more. So number one, Ukraine can win, and given the arms, I think they will win. Number two... I think we have to do a better job in Congress and, and in the administration of conveying to the American public that we're actually not sending that much money to Ukraine. We're sending money to American industry that is then producing materiel that we are sending over to Ukraine. This is a twofer. Not only are we helping an ally fight on the front lines of the free world for our values, we are also boosting the U.S. military industrial complex and creating jobs almost a billion dollars just to my home state of Massachusetts alone from these Ukraine packages. That's really important when you think that we are shifting in our military readiness from a precision guided missile regime towards more of an AI plus autonomous uh, regime. We need this opportunity to learn how drone swarms are gonna operate on battlefields and Ukraine is a living laboratory to do that in. So it's a tremendous opportunity for the US military complex to shift off of uh, old fashioned tactics and ensure that should we be in combat again, we're not fighting the last war. And then the final point I'll make, Tim, is just the message it sends to allies. You know, I, I met with the Taiwanese ambassador a couple days ago. He was quite clear that the Chinese during the latest Taiwanese election were pumping in disinformation to the Ta Taiwanese electorate that the United States was a fair weather friend, that we're not going to honor our commitments in the Indo Pacific. And do not doubt for a second that Xi Jinping, as well as the Taiwanese are watching very closely what happens in Ukraine. And any Republicans who want to claim that they're tough on China but soft on Russia uh, are living in contradiction. Yeah. What? So speak, speaking of uh, maybe one of those congressmen, uh, there are a handful of old line national security members on the Republican side. And are you talking to any of them? Like, what do the Mike Gallagher's of the world say when you say to them, like, you know, we can get this material over to Ukraine if you guys will work with us? It doesn't matter what they say to me on the House floor. I, I have plenty of thoughtful conversations with House Republicans, with Senate Republicans, who who get it right. They're they're in their in their fiber. They're functionally Reagan Republicans. Uh, doesn't matter what they say to me, though. We've been through this for seven years now. It matters what they do when faced with the threat of a MAGA primary challenge. That's you know this Tim yeah. better than anybody else. At the end of the day, the courage to stand up to a MAGA primary challenge is what defines uh, the modern Republican Party. And they have demonstrated a complete absence of that courage. And until and unless they do, things are not going to change in 2024.
Okay. Well, I hope in those private conversations, you're shaming them and making them think about, you know, how their, how their mothers are shaking their fingers at them, especially the Catholic ones. Um, okay. Uh, final thing on the, final thing on the policy, what the immigration side of this, I mean, I, that is the big news today. I, you know, the, the, uh, there've been some discussions that maybe some in the democratic side didn't want to deal on this. And, but you've got to feel like now, like this is a major political football. Like, where do you think the, the, the party should be on this? What's your sense for what's needed on the immigration side of this? Immigration is the hardest issue in Washington, full stop. And doing it in an election year with Donald Trump <laughs> only makes it harder. But I'm not willing to throw up my hands and say, well, it's hard and it can't be done because the brokenness of our immigration system is a major liability for our nation. Uh, and it needs to be resolved. I'm one of the very few Democrats who's a co-sponsor of bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform. It's called the Dignity Act. And it's a compromise. I wouldn't have drafted every single word myself, but it's the kind of bill that could pass Congress. It was done through collaboration between a Republican congresswoman from Florida and a Texas congresswoman uh, uh, who's a Democrat. And both Latinas, both well-versed uh, on the issue, both directly affected by it in their districts. and and they came together in good faith and came out with a product that I think represents a lot of important compromises. It has uh, a rationalization of our asylum and visa system. It improves border security. It creates an upskilling fund for American workers. It creates preclearance centers in countries of origin. It allows for documentation and dignity for dreamers. That's the kind of legislation that we need to see uh, ultimately in Congress. And in the immediate term, uh, I've been clear for months now that Democrats absolutely should negotiate on a more tightly scoped border security package. But if we are now hearing from Republicans that they'd rather campaign on the border than govern on it, it's, it unfortunately will be torpedoed. Yeah. So that takes us to the strategic side of this and what I liked. I mean, you were, uh, I guess maybe not alone, I think there were, maybe there were two of you that on the Democratic side that voted against the CR, um, you know, uh, without some of the viewers here probably don't don't care about the uh, the machinations of uh, you know a house about how how exactly house budgets get passed et cetera. But I, the, the basic right. gist of this is that in order to fund the government, you know the Republicans have been unable to do it within their own conference, and uh, this was what brought down McCarthy and what Johnson is dealing with now. And so they've been funding the government based on continuing resolutions at the Nancy Pelosi budget level, right? So they haven't even actually achieved any of their objectives. Um, and in order to to do that, they've needed Democratic votes, right? Because there's a hand, there's a significant percentage of Republicans in the Freedom Caucus and otherwise that aren't going to vote for these continuing resolutions. And so the government has kept open, kept open on the backs of you know, this minority of the Republican conference and the Democrats going along with these continuing resolutions. Your, you know, statement on this was it was essentially, uh, or here it is, I'm not bailing out Republicans of their appropriations mess unless they uh, commit to Ukraine. So as we stare this down now from a strategic approach, Ukraine, it's, it's hard to see how Ukraine gets funded. Uh, even Mitch is starting to get wet feet on the border. You know, what is the Democrats move, you know, in, as we head to March, should more of them be, you know, kind of having the same posture that you have, which is playing hardball on this and kind of daring the Republicans to shut the government down if they don't agree to these common sense policies in Ukraine and at the border? Uh, I'm certainly not going to vote for another continuing resolution that does not have a clear, credible and concrete plan for supporting Ukraine. And what's doubly frustrating about the situation is that uh, we had a deal on funding levels back in, in May. Speaker McCarthy and President Biden negotiated it. It was a compromise deal. It modestly reduced federal spending in a way that both parties could uh, accept. And it was House Republicans who walked away from it. So House Republicans agreed to something, reneged upon it, created a mess, deposed their speaker, uh, and now are unable to claw their way out of the mess without Democratic support. Uh, and I worry that we, we face a situation where this could continue, continuing resolution after continuing resolution all the way until the election in November. Uh, and that doesn't serve the American people well, and it certainly doesn't serve our allies well, Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan. Yeah. I mean, what is, is there a sense, do you get a sense that others uh, share that view? Or are you kind of, you, you a man on an island on that one? 
I, I think I am um, differentiated in the ferocity of my passion for <laughs> supporting and defending Ukraine. I, I really continually try to put this in the bigger picture of yeah. the entire Pax Americana is under siege right now through a, 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 the axis of China, Iran, and Russia. And these conflicts, everywhere from the Red Sea and the Houthis through uh, Hamas, through the Kremlin, through the, the South China Sea, they are linked. They are, they are linked through these revanchist um, powers that are trying to let the past bury the future. And the United States, even in the midst of our own divisions, uh, needs to help the world defend the rules-based order that has done so much good for people. Well, uh, Congressman, I hope that other folks back you up on this. And as uh, the reality of this comes through in March, that um, that that pressure can be put on, uh, you know, because I think that a lot of there were, there were some people, you know, in the pundit class, not here, that criticized you guys for not bailing out Republicans on the McCarthy thing, you know, on the McCarthy speakership. I always thought that was preposterous. Like the Republicans totally. won this House. They have their own. If, if they can't govern. Then they then they need to figure out something else and come to the table and and work and, and and work with Democrats to govern. And if they refuse to do that, then then maybe they should be forced to walk the plank. At least that's my my view on all this. Speaker McCarthy's only legacy will be that in the weeks following January sixth, he helped resuscitate Donald Trump in a narrow window of opportunity that this country had to finally put him behind us. And that is a grievous legacy to bear. But the idea that Democrats suddenly somehow had an obligation to bail him out of his own mess when he wouldn't even deign to negotiate with his counterparts is ludicrous. Yeah. And then he walks out without doing it, you know, wants credit for being the adults in charge, but they walk out and left this mess in, in Johnson's lap, right? And you made the point, they could have come, the, the deal, immigration funding, Ukraine funding, it was on the table, Biden offered it, you guys agreed to it. It's been on the table for months now. And, and, and McCarthy walked away from it to protect himself, and he ended up getting nothing. So now he's home at Bakersfield, and uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe Mr. Trump will make him to Commerce Secretary or something, and, uh, and God forbid. Oh, I doubt that Donald Trump will ever return his phone calls again. <laughs> um, Congressman Jake Hoggenklaus, man, thank you so much. I appreciate how stalwart you've been on this. Um, do keep in touch and keep us posted, and uh, we'll hope to be talking to you again soon. Thanks for having me on, Tim. Be well. Of course.